Virginia Woolf Monday or Tuesday Narrated by Cathy Slump Lazy and indifferent, shaking space easily from his wings, knowing his way, the heron passes over the church beneath the sky. White and distant, absorbed in itself, endlessly the sky covers and uncovers, moves and remains. A lake? Blot the shores of it out. A mountain? Oh, perfect, the sun gold on its slopes. Down that falls. Ferns, then, or white feathers, forever and ever. Desiring truth, awaiting it, laboriously distilling a few words, forever desiring. A cry starts to the left, another to the right. Wheels strike divergently. Omnibuses conglomerate in conflict. Forever desiring. The clock asseverates with twelve distinct strokes that it is midday. Light sheds gold scales. Children swarm, forever desiring truth. Red is the dome. Coins hang on the trees. Smoke trails from the chimneys. Ugh, shout, cry iron for sale. And truth? Radiating to a point, men's feet and women's feet, black or gold encrusted. This foggy weather. Sugar? No, thank you. The Commonwealth of the Future. The firelight darting and making the room red, save for the black figures and their bright eyes, while outside a van discharges. Miss Thingamy drinks tea at her desk, and plate glass preserves fur coats. Flaunted, leaf light, drifting at corners, blown across the wheels, silver splashed, home or not home, gathered, scattered, squandered in separate scales, swept up, down, torn, sunk, assembled. And truth? Now to recollect by the fireside on the white square of marble. From ivory depths, words rising, shed their blackness, blossom and penetrate. Fallen the book. In the flame, in the smoke, in the momentary sparks, or now voyaging, the marble square pendant, minarets beneath and the Indian seas, while space rushes blue and stars glint. Truth? Or now, content with closeness. Lazy and indifferent, the heron returns. The sky veils her stars, then bears them. Virginia Woolf Adeline Virginia Woolf, nay Stephen, 25 January 1882 to 28 March 1941, was an English writer who is considered one of the foremost modernists of the 20th century and a pioneer in the use of stream of consciousness as a narrative device. Born in an affluent household in Kensington, London, she attended King's College, London, and was acquainted with the early reformers of women's higher education. Having been homeschooled for much of her childhood, mostly in English classics and Victorian literature, Wolf began writing professionally in 1900. During the interwar period, Wolf was a significant figure 
in London Literary Society and a central figure in the influential Bloomsbury Group of Intellectuals. She published her first novel, titled The Voyage Out, in 1915, through the Hogarth Press, a publishing house that she established with her husband, Leonard Wolfe. Her best-known works include the novels Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, To the Lighthouse, 1927, and Orlando, 1928, and the book-length essay A Room of One's Own, 1929, with its dictum, A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Wolf became one of the central subjects of the 1970s movement of feminist criticism, and her works have since garnered much attention and widespread commentary for inspiring feminism, an aspect of her writing that was unheralded earlier. Her works are widely read all over the world and have been translated into more than 50 languages. She suffered from severe bouts of mental illness throughout her life and took her own life by drowning in 1941 at the age of 59. Works Wolf is a major novelist and one of the pioneers among modernist writers using stream of consciousness as a narrative device, alongside her contemporaries Marcel Proust, Dorothy Richardson and James Joyce. Wolfe's reputation declined sharply after World War II, but her importance was re-established with the growth of feminist criticism in the 1970s. She began writing professionally in 1900. The first of her writings to be accepted for publication, Horworth, November 1904, a journalistic account of a visit to the Bronte family home at Horworth, was published anonymously in a women's supplement to a clerical journal, The Guardian, in December 1904. From 1905, she wrote for the Times Literary Supplement. Her first novel, The Voyage Out, was published in 1915 by her half-brother's imprint, Gerald Duckworth and Company Limited. This novel was originally titled Melimbrosia, but Wolfe repeatedly changed the draft. An earlier version of The Voyage Out has been reconstructed by Wolfe scholar Louise de Salvo and is now available to the public under the intended title. De Salvo argues that many of the changes Wolfe made in the text were in response to changes in her own life. Wolfe went on to publish novels and essays as a public intellectual to both critical and popular acclaim. Much of her work was self-published through the Hogarth Press. Virginia Woolf's peculiarities as a fiction writer have tended to obscure her central strength. She is arguably the major lyrical novelist in the English language. Her novels are highly experimental. A narrative, frequently uneventful and commonplace, is refracted, and sometimes almost dissolved, in the character's receptive consciousness. Intense lyricism and stylistic virtuosity fuse to create a world overabundant with auditory and visual impressions. The intensity of Virginia Woolf's poetic vision elevates the ordinary, sometimes banal settings, often wartime environments, of most of her novels. For example, Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, centers on the efforts of Clarissa Dalloway, a middle-aged society woman, to organize a party even as her life is paralleled with that of Septimus Warren Smith, a working-class veteran who has returned from the First World War, bearing deep psychological scars. To the Lighthouse, 1927, 
is set on two days, ten years apart. The plot centers on the Ramsey family's anticipation of, and reflection upon, a visit to a lighthouse and the connected familial tensions. One of the primary themes of the novel is the struggle in the creative process that beset painter Lily Briscoe while she struggles to paint in the midst of the family drama. The novel is also a meditation upon the lives of a nation's inhabitants in the midst of war and of the people left behind. It also explores the passage of time and how women are forced by society to allow men to take emotional strength from them. Orlando, 1928, is one of Virginia Woolf's lightest novels, a parodic biography of a young nobleman who lives for three centuries without aging much past 30, but who does abruptly turn into a woman. The book is in part a portrait of Woolf's lover, Vita Sackville West. It was meant to console Vita for the loss of her ancestral home, Knoll House, though it is also a satirical treatment of Vita and her work. In Orlando, the techniques of historical biographers are being ridiculed. The character of a pompous biographer is being assumed in order for it to be mocked. The Waves, 1931, presents a group of six friends whose reflections, which are closer to recitatives than to interior monologues proper, create a wave-like atmosphere that is more akin to a prose poem than to a plot-centred novel. Flush, a biography, 1933, is a part fiction, part biography of the Cocker Spaniel owned by Victorian poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning. The book is written from the dog's point of view. Wolfe was inspired to write this book from the success of the Rudolf Bézier play The Barretts of Wimpole Street. In the play, Flush is on stage for much of the action. The play was produced for the first time in 1932 by the actress Catherine Cornell. Her last work, Between the Acts, 1941, sums up and magnifies Wolfe's chief preoccupations, the transformation of life through art, sexual ambivalence, and meditation on the themes of flux of time and life, presented simultaneously as corrosion and rejuvenation, all set in a highly imaginative and symbolic narrative encompassing almost all of English history. This book is the most lyrical of all her works, not only in feeling, but in style, being chiefly written in verse. While Wolfe's work can be understood as consistently in dialogue with the Bloomsbury group, particularly its tendency, informed by G. E. Moore, among others, towards doctrinaire rationalism, it is not a simple recapitulation of the Coterie's ideals. Wolfe's works have been translated into over 50 languages by writers such as Jorge Luis Borges and Marguerite Yosena. After completing the manuscript of her last posthumously published novel, Between the Acts, Wolfe fell into a deep depression similar to that which she had earlier experienced. The onset of World War II, the destruction of her London home during the Blitz, and the cool reception given to her biography of her late friend Roger Fry all worsened her condition until she was unable to work. When Leonard enlisted in the Home Guard, he obtained the disapproval of Virginia, who held fast to her pacifism and criticised her husband 
for wearing what she considered to be the silly uniform of the Home Guard. After World War II began, Wolf's diary was consumed with an obsession with death, a subject that figured more and more as her mood darkened. On 28 March 1941, Wolf drowned herself by filling her overcoat pockets with stones and walking into the River Ouse near her home. Her body was not found until 18 April. Her husband buried her cremated remains beneath an elm tree in the garden of Monk's house, their home in Rodmel, Sussex. In her suicide note, addressed to her husband, she wrote, Dearest, I feel certain that I am going mad again. I feel we can't go through another of those terrible times, and I shan't recover this time. I begin to hear voices, and I can't concentrate. So I am doing what seems the best thing to do. You have given me the greatest possible happiness. You have been in every way all that anyone could be. I don't think two people could have been happier till this terrible disease came. I can't fight any longer. I know that I am spoiling your life, that without me you could work, and you will, I know. You see, I can't even write this properly. I can't read. What I want to say is, I owe all the happiness of my life to you. You have been entirely patient with me and incredibly good. I want to say that. Everybody knows it. If anybody could have saved me, it would have been you. Everything has gone from me but the certainty of your goodness. I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been.